Well, hello, hello, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast. I am excited to have the amazing Dr. Sweldo here. Um, she's a double board certified OBGYN and fertility specialist. And I brought her onto the show because she has been talking about, you know, fertility, infertility, all of that stuff. And then I saw where she was talking about it in physicians. And then she had this hashtag, we will not accept one in four. And when she said that, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to get her onto the podcast. So I want you to lean into this episode because you really are going to be blown away. Remember, this podcast is all about creating change in medicine, and she is doing a phenomenal job of doing that. So Dr. Sweldo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Una, for having me on. Of course. All right. So I'm going to give you a moment to introduce yourself to the listeners because they're like, Dr. Una is so pumped. Okay. Tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> so as you mentioned, you know, I do infertility. Um, it really, it truly is a passion. You know, I, I know it sounds cheesy and all of that, but I really do love it. Um, and it doesn't feel like work at all. And when I first went into the specialty, I was really drawn to it by all the scientific advancements, like what is done in the IVF lab never, I mean, to this day, doesn't cease to amaze me. It's just so, so cool what they get to do. Um, but I really, I fell in love with my specialty once I was in it because it's, it's such a special bond that you form with your patients. I mean, I've been in practice seven years now and I have patients back from when I was a fellow sending me, you know, updates of their kiddos and whatnot. And that you really truly help, you know, these people in such a hard, uh, hard time of their life. And so anyway, so I love, I love it for the relationships. I, I live it, you know, because it's really it's something I'm passionate about for my patients. Um, and the we will not accept one in four. So where does that come from? Um, so I have always thought, you know, fertility awareness and fertility education, um, we just, we really don't do a good job of that in, in our country, in our society. And really, even within the medical space, and even within OBGYN professionals, the understanding of fertility and, you know, ovarian aging and, you know, the time constraints and whatnot, all these things uh, are not really well understood. And so, you know, even amongst sort of those people that are supposed to know, we recognize that there is limitations. And I think, you know, it's so powerful to hear stats like one in eight or one in four, because I think it sort of drives home the point. Um, so in the U.S., we know that infertility affects roughly one in eight couples. One in eight is the same statistics as breast cancer. And we have a whole month dedicated to breast cancer, the NFL, the NBA, they all go pink, they all do that, which is great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love that they have all this awareness, but the frequency or, or the incidence is just as common and you don't hear people talking about infertility at all. And last summer, um, there was a big study published that included over 800 female physicians and the stats were just alarming. I mean, my jaw dropped when I read that paper and it really, it showed that one in four female physicians had trouble in their family building journey. Um, and, and I say to that, we need to do better. And that's really part of my mission in all of this. I cannot begin to tell you how much I love all of this. I can't, but for a number of reasons. Now, when you talk about, you know, one in eight, and you're saying that's the same incidence as breast cancer, um, you took it a step further because you're like, then I'm going to do something about that. Right. And yeah. it's not unusual for us to find things. And we're like, oh, that is awful. And walk away. Now, some of those things are, they're not our, you know, they're not our heels to die on. And so we're not going to do anything about it. But sometimes, um, especially for someone listening where you've had a mission that's been calling you and maybe you're thinking, who am I to do something like that? Or I don't have the skills to do anything about that. I am telling you that the the one in eight, quote unquote, they're waiting for you. Like yeah. you're the person for the job and you may be scared and we all are, Dr. Sweldo. Yeah. Fear oh, anywhere. 100, right. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah. so we're we're afraid. We're but we're doing it because of yeah. that person 
that one in eight, right? They will take yeah. your stuff done fearfully. They will not say, you didn't do this courageously. I don't care. No, they will take it. They need yeah. you to rise up. If there are skills you're like, I don't have, you can acquire those skills. We're physicians. If there's anything we are great at, not just good, great at, it's acquiring skills. And so I just say that to say, if you're, if you're listening to this and something's been tugging at your heart, you don't, you're afraid, you don't know your next steps, you feel like you don't have the skills, this is a time to say yes. It, it really is because the one in eight is, is waiting on you. And then secondly, my goodness, one in four, that's two times, <laughs> like there's double the problem here, right? And so so talk to us, what, what are the risk factors, right? That make it twice as much, twice as sure. common for, for physicians. Sure. So, I mean, I think the the sort of glaringly obvious one is, you know, everything in our lives gets delayed or postponed because of our training. Um, and here in the U.S., you know, even if you go straight through and you're super stellar A plus student, you're still putting in a solid eight to 10 years um, before you even get to residency. And then you have your residency, you know, your specialty training. And if you do a fellowship like myself, subspecialty training. And so a lot of times families, and I don't say this to say families are not important, but I think that we're on just such a track that we sort of say, okay, well, when I finish this or when I finish that, um, and, and I would say that that is true for most professional women, but I think you see that in a very nuclear sort of um, capsule fashion in the physician world. So what are some of the things you talked about, you know, OBGYNs, even OBGYNs, there's a lot of awareness about, you know, infertility that's absent, right? What is it that you wish physicians knew about infertility? Yeah, they're all, they're so, all listening to you now. I know. Right? <laughs> so I think number one, I think it's so important that that physicians understand it's more common than you think. And so when a patient comes to you with a concern or a question, just because she's 29 or just because she's, you know, X, Y, or Z fill in the blank doesn't mean, oh, just keep trying. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, you know, address the concern. And I'm not saying that all OBGYNs have to become specialists. That's not the point, but refer out. And, and you know, any fertility specialist will tell you they're happy to do a preconception visit, um, have that appointment, provide the counseling, provide the information, provide the testing that might be recommended. Um, so just, I think that awareness and the, and the knowing not to dismiss, but knowing to say, you know what, hey, let's address that. That's a question you have. That's a concern you have. Let's take that one step further and have you see somebody, um, you know, and, and I think, it's really tough for me when I hear so many stories of friends of mine who are, I wish somebody would have told me when I was 35. I wish someone would have listened to me. You know, I have female physicians who have asked about egg freezing and they're like, oh, don't worry about it. You have plenty of time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think acknowledging those concerns and, and really validating them is only going to help that patient in the long time, in the long run. Okay. That that's helpful. That's really helpful. And and then so for the physician, um, so let's go all the way back. So let's say somebody is um out of, you know, got out of high school, um, is in pre-med, right? And you're like, oh, I caught him early, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. this is this is a this is a female person in pre-med, and you're like, sure. man, let me talk to you about something. You you may go like yeah. Dr. Swaldo, I don't even know what you're talking about, but I just need you to hear me. Um, yeah. this is important. You'll thank me later. What would you tell yeah. them? And of course, everybody's journey is different, right? So we're not trying to create right. some kind of prescription, right? But there, there's right. an awareness right. that they should have, right? So exactly. And I'm also not trying to say everyone needs to freeze egg and sperm. Like that's not at all the message I'm trying to convey. It's really about education. So the, because, and I, I look back on myself when I was in my mid twenties, like I didn't even know if I wanted a family. I mean, you're just so on a different wavelength at that time. So for me, the first important thing is, have you thought about, do you want a family? Has that even, you know, is that even on your radar? And if it is great, what does that look like for you? Is that a five-year plan? Is that a 10-year plan? Is that, you know, in a year, et cetera? Um, and so I think trying to understand what that looks like. And then the other thing I would say is, do you know that the ovaries have an expiration date? 
do you know that once you hit 35 and not that something magical happens on your birthday, right? We all as physicians understand it's a continuum, but after age 35, we begin to see a very real decline in the number and quality of the eggs that we have. So if you're going to do something about this, not that you need to do it today, not that you need to do it tomorrow, but it needs to be on your radar. Um, for me personally, and this is not, I want to be clear, this is my own view, not like any guideline, I, the ideal time to consider being proactive and sort of taking measures, whether it's sperm freezing or egg freezing, seems to be somewhere in that ballpark of 30 to 35. Because at that point, I think most adults know whether or not they want to have a family. Most of them are in a professional situation where they could actually consider it because it is financially, you know, something that needs to be taken under consideration. Um, and, and you still have the egg quality is still considered sort of at its peak, if you will. So um, in terms of being proactive and actually taking measures, you have time, but as long as you're aware, you know, you're informed. Um, and then the other thing I would say a step further, if patients are anxious about it and how do I even know if my egg supply is good or bad or high or low or et cetera, well, there is testing that we can do to check the number, not the quality, but the number of eggs that we're working with. So why don't we just take a look and see if everything looks good, you're reassured and you're, you know, you can kind of go about your planning. If the numbers come back low, that may accelerate your plan or at least help you in your decision-making process. The other thing that I'll sort of qualify my answer is if the patient has something that is out of the norm, so you are skipping periods or your periods are super painful, you're calling out of work, or you know you have a history of multiple surgeries, you know, I have patients who come to me at 24, 25, they've already lost an ovary for X reason or whatnot. So those are all risk factors that you want to make sure you're taking into consideration when you're listening to this information. Um, and you want to make sure that those are being considered when your doctor's saying, oh, you know, we have, you have time or you're young or whatnot. You want to make sure all those things are being thought through. Man, that's good. <laughs> yeah, clearly this is something I love. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> this is so good. And you know, I I'm I'm grateful that you're like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm grateful that you're doing this. And and it sounds like it's an important conversation to be had. Cause I'm trying to think about when I was in med school um and when I was in residency. I don't remember ever, ever having you know, I mean, we talk about everything, right? But I, I don't remember ever having a conversation about, okay, have you thought, have you thought about if you want to have a family? Have you thought about timelines? Have you thought about, you know, egg freezing and all? Like, I don't, I don't remember that conversation. But if we're talking about one in four, this is a yeah. conversation that needs to be had, right? And so people can make informed decisions, whether that's I'm going now, I'm going to have a baby in residency, because that's what I want to do. I'm going to wait and freeze my eggs and do it later. Like, you know, but at least you've, made your decisions, you right. know, and of course, you know, I will say that Dr. Swaldo is giving you information and this is not considered <laughs> medical advice. Okay. Exactly. And so, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so consult with your physician. Okay. Yeah. But this is, yeah. this is, this is so good. Now, if you think, because this is your mission, right? If you think, wow, we are going to end this statistic, right? This one in four, when you think about it, how do you think about that happening, right? Because this is not necessarily a one-on-one. -on -one. This is how do we reach the physician community? What, what are your thoughts around that? How do you amplify? So I think I think there's really two approaches, right? So one is sort of direct to consumer and the education of the audience. And so empowering the patient to ask for these things or to understand these things and know about these things, um, which is a big part of why I'm in all the spaces, YouTube, Instagram, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, never wanted to do that by choice, but here we are. <laughs> and, and news media, she's doing yeah. all the things, people. She's yeah. committed to her mission. So, so one thing is empowering the audience and the patient to ask for it. But then the other thing is educating the physician community. And so by way of this podcast, by way of physician groups, by way of speaking, I just, you know, a couple of weeks ago spoke here in, in my regional area, et cetera, um, and really understanding that this is, it has to be a part of the conversation. Um, you know, let's go, let's take it a step further. So the, the American Society of Oncology, back in 2012, I, want, I think it was like 10 years ago, they stipulated as a guideline, fertility preservation needs to be discussed with every reproductive age person, male or female, that is about to undergo chemo or radiation. Every single one. So it's been around for 10 years. It's not like something that came out yesterday. 
this is still something that I fight against. This is still something that I struggle with in terms of educating the physician community. Because the patient, from the moment they hear cancer, they don't hear anything else, right? Like that, I mean, there's no way you're talking about fertility at that visit. So separating that out, having the visit with the fertility specialist, and then the patient can decide, right? We, we talk all the time about informed consent. This is all about informed decision-making. So the patient ultimately can decide whether they want to proceed, but at least you've given them the option. At least you've given them the information. And, you know, for me, it's, it's terrible and it sucks when you're on the other side and they come to you after everything is said and done. Okay. You know, now that I'm in remission, everything is good. Now I want to try and have a baby. And I'm looking at them like, you know, and I, and it's a, it's a hard conversation yeah. to have after everything they've just been through. So, you know, I think that as a physician community, we can do better. And, and by way of this podcast and other, you know, other channels where we can all connect and reach each other, I think we will affect change. Okay, so for everyone listening, you are a physician and maybe you are in a women's physician group or anything like that. Um, I'm going to say, and she's probably like, oh my goodness, what is Dr. Una going to say? But if you are, if you want to have these con conversations, you want to have talks around this, then Dr. Sweldo is the person for you. And so you can reach out to her. Uh, she, clearly, she's a really great speaker. And um, and then we can start facilitating these things, the, these conversations, because they need to be had. And Dr. Swaldo, if someone was looking for a place to, you know, follow you or share your resources, I believe you have a YouTube channel. Is that where they would go, where they yeah. can find <clears throat> Yeah. So the YouTube channel um, is literally just my name, Dr. Carolina Sweldo. They're quick 10 minute clips. Um, you know, I, my attention span is not great. So I had to make them short for everybody else as well. Um, and the patient can kind of sift through and, and sort of customize, you know, which ones they want to look through. Um, and then I'm on social media. I would love to, to hit you, you know, hit me up on Instagram, send me a DM, let me know what questions, concerns, thoughts you have, would love to engage in that conversation. Love it. And just so you know, I'll just tell you, because I have inside information, you ask questions in the DMs, she'll make YouTube videos for you. Okay. This is just great. <laughs> this is how this works. Okay. Um, so, so this is amazing. I, I'm so, I'm so glad you shared this and I didn't realize how much of a problem, you know, it is. So I'm glad that I brought you on the podcast. Now, when we talk about the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast, um, I say that this is more than a podcast, it's a movement, and it's a movement of change in the physician community. So there's a million of us, if we don't like the way things are, we can change them, right? And so I tell everybody, like, listening to this is great, but you're part of the Calvary, you're part of the change, and so you need to share it with another doctor, right? And so for this episode, why would you say that the doctors listening absolutely need to share this episode with the doctors in their lives? So, so number one, I, well, first of all, I just want to, number one, agree with your statement. I think that a lot of times as physicians, we don't realize how much power we actually have. And I think that we have sort of relegated that power and we need to take it back. And so if we take action, our actions will, will be more impactful if we do that together. The second thing is that I can't do this alone. Fertility as a specialty can't do this alone. We rely on our partners, whether that's oncology, whether that's OB-GYN, whether that's PCP, whatever you, endocrine, I mean, an endless number of providers, physicians who, if they can capture the patient and if they can, you know, and give that out that information initially, it saves the patient so much heartache down the line. So if you share it with one physician and that one physician then takes action on one patient, you've just changed a life. Oh, and it that. truly is changing lives. It truly is. When you see, you know, and I always tell my medical students, like when you see what it is for, for a couple to be able to have a family, to be able to live out their dream of family building and to have that child, that, that boy or that girl, it truly is life changing for them. Um, so, so don't, don't, uh, don't diminish the impact of what you can do by just sharing something like this. Yikes. So good. Okay. And I will add that you also want to share it with the, the female physicians in your life. You want to share it with the female med students, you know, the female residents, and just so they have the awareness. This is not about 
you know, we have not made a prescription today. We have just said, this is what is going on. These are the, the risks and these are the options that we have and things like that. So they can start making those decisions. They can have, they can make informed decisions and really they can have the advantage of being aware at a younger age, right? Especially for those of us who are older, like, yeah, exactly. like they don't have to go through this, right? And that's how we change the st statistic of one in four, right? Is by reaching out and saying, hey, go take a listen and go make some decisions, you know? So so please share the episode with the doctors that you know, don't feel like you're oversharing. We are changing a whole industry and we need all mm -hmm. hands on deck. So thank you for doing that. Dr. Swaldo, I wanna say, you know, not just thank you for coming on this show, which I'm so grateful you came on. This has been very good for me too. Um, but I want to say thank you for saying yes to a Herculean mission, right? <laughs> We're talking something that's one in eight, you know what I mean? And that's, that's a huge number. And yeah. um, I'm grateful that you said yes to that because you started here, but who knows what happens in two years what happens in five years, what happens after a decade. And I'm clear that you're going to do that because you are, you said yes to it. You're embracing it. You're doing it scared. You're acquiring the skills to get it done. And it's only a matter of time. So thank you. I almost feel like I'm talking to a veteran, like, thank you for your service, right? Like, <laughs> th thank you so much for what you're doing. This is, is so, it's so, so, so important. So thank you. Thank you so much. You're going to make me get all emotional over here. Uh, no, but truly, I, I do it. It's a passion. I truly do it because I believe in it. And, um, you know, like you said, I don't know where the future will take me. But to anyone who will listen, I'm, I'm willing to have the conversation. Love it. Keep changing lives, Doc. Okay, people, <laughs> you heard her. Go share the episode because you can change lives. Okay, so share it with the doctors in your life. And I will see you on the next episode of the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast.